Gosh, there are a lot of extinction stories, I'm afraid. To some extent, we don't really know what we've lost. It's a question of whether we're going to have dinner on the table, who's going to have it, how much is going to be there, and whether it's going to be there. A failing agricultural system is going to create massive social and geopolitical problems. We're going to say it's just coincidence, and it's not really our fault. The longer we do that, the more dangerous it's going to be for us because the hole is getting deeper. We're digging it deeper. First of all, I didn't know it was going to lead this far, and I didn't know I would spend my life doing it. Not at all. I was just a typical kid, more or less growing up in the city, but spending a fair amount of time on my grandmother's farm. She wanted me to be a farmer. The other side of the family thought I would go into some kind of public service. It never occurred to me that those two things could be joined. I'm Carrie Fowler. I've been involved with the Svalbard Global Seed Vault since the very beginning. The biggest innovation behind it was to keep it simple. We wanted a place that was remote, so it was far away from a lot of the dangers in the world. It was also very cold. It would remain below freezing all the time. So this is a perfect place. Well, the seed vault, you could describe it in a couple of ways. One, you could just say it's a room with seeds at the end of a long tunnel in a mountain. At its simple form, that's really what it is. If you dig down a little deeper than the tunnel, you all of a sudden are beginning a, a story. You're entering something, and you're going to have to walk to get there. You could think of the seed vault as being a library of life for which we have an incomplete card catalog. We know the books are there. We know they contain a wealth of information, but we haven't quite read them all yet. We don't quite understand the knowledge that's there. You will eventually see this door that's totally encrusted with ice crystals that will twinkle and shine like the Milky Way, almost like a billion stars. and you, you know instantly that, whoa, there's something behind that door. That can just stay open. The seeds that are in there represent the history of agriculture. So what they really represent is the experiences that our crops have had over 12, 15,000 years. That's where the diversity really comes from. It came from a very complex interaction of people, plants, and environment. People selecting for certain things that they liked, culinary qualities, taste, shapes, colors, nutrition, and the environment. You know, carrots come in a lot of different colors, so you can get yellow ones and red ones and purple and white and all kinds of things. We just think of carrots as being orange, but uh, actually that's just, just the beginning. I was showing some pictures to a grade five class, and I said, do you know what biodiversity is? And all these hands shot up in the air, so I picked one. I said, yeah, okay, what is it? This kid with eyes the size of saucers, you know? He said, well, there are two kinds of biodiversity. He said one kind is the kind uh, that's like you find in the tropical rainforest, and that's the diversity between species. He said, but there's a more important kind of biodiversity, and that's the diversity within species. 
because that's what gives them the ability to evolve. <laughs> I thought, kid, you come up here. <laughs> One example is, is right behind you. <laughs> it's from about the 1880s in Rhineland, and you will see examples of rust disease infect the different leaves, so this is not good for the trees. But here's an example of diversity, because right next to it, we have this Binet Rouge, which is a, a cider apple, I guess you would say, from France, also in the 1880s. And as you can see, there's really no rust on this one whatsoever. I can't find a single spot. So if something bad happens to this plant, well, maybe this one comes through. And that just um, <clears throat> gives you a little bit of insurance. My focus and my real concern has been that we're losing diversity within species, within tomatoes, within the melons, within corn and wheat. We're losing that uh, day by day. And so there's a real urgency. If we don't collect it and conserve it now, then we're not going to have it ever in the future. We haven't had systems to conserve the diversity as it's been replaced by the modern varieties. And so we've lost, as in becoming extinct, a lot of diversity. We don't exist as a species on Earth ourselves if we don't have this biological foundation of agriculture. History teaches that a nation grows according to its agriculture, the very basis of life. We're headed for climate, certainly in Africa and other areas that have never before existed in the whole history of agriculture. The crops are on the front lines. They're the first thing that's really going to experience climate change. And they're not adapted to conditions they've never seen before. Our domesticated crops are totally dependent on us. Their survival depends on us. That's our future, like it or not. We're together. You realize that extinction is really not about the last individual dying, it's about a species losing the ability to evolve. The food shortages and huge rise in prices gripping the world's poorest countries are among the worst seen in a generation. For farmers, it's a race against time. They've got to prepare their fields for winter planting, but they also need seeds. The coldest growing seasons are going to be hotter than anything those crops have seen in the past. By 2030, in South Africa, we'll have a 30% decrease in production of maize because of the climate change already. 30% decrease of production in the context of increasing population, that's a food crisis, it's global in nature, we will watch children starve to death on TV. You may say that 20 years is a long way off, it's two breeding cycles for maize. We have two rolls of the dice to get this right. We have to get climate ready crops in the field and we have to do that rather quickly. Because quite literally, if agriculture doesn't adapt to climate change, neither will we. What are we doing if we're not conserving that foundation of our own civilization. I had cancer the first time when I was quite young. They guessed that I had about six months. And at that age, I wondered, you know, the most profound questions. Well, what, what has this all been about? What, why? When you 
you have cancer, you see things and hear things very intensely. Little things don't escape you. Just the sound of a little bird chirping or the sound of leaves rustling in the autumn, the colors of grass just emerging from the ground in the spring. There's a lot that we pass by on a daily basis. And we don't stop to appreciate it. What I did learn from having cancer is you don't want to get to the end of your days truly dying, having a lot of regrets. You might be interested in the story. I was living in North Carolina and a woman came to my office one day and she said, you know, when I was growing up, I had this favorite apple and it was called Magnum Bonum. Do you think it still exists? And I looked in my list and there it was. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry. Where did you get that apple? Willie Jones Orchard in Cana, Virginia. So I hopped in the car and I drove to Cana, Virginia. And on the outskirts of town, I see this old weathered sign and it said Willie Jones Orchard and it had an arrow pointing. I thought, <laughs> well, okay, uh, you know, this is fate. And I went up to this house and this big guy came to the door and what do you want? I said, well, I'm here to talk to you about your apples. And he said, um, I bet you're here to talk about that Magnum Bonum apple. I said, yeah. He said, my father and I, we chopped down all those trees about 20 years ago. We replaced them with all these modern varieties. Uh, and he kind of smiled and he said, but we, we always thought somebody would come knocking and want that apple, so we saved three of those trees. <laughs> you did? I said, do you know which three trees they were? Because it was a big, huge orchard. He said, yeah, get in the truck and I'll go take you to them. And we drove out in the middle of this orchard. He said, this one, this one, and this one the last three Magnum Bunnams left in the world. Gosh, there are a lot of extinction stories, I'm afraid. To some extent, we don't really know what we've lost. So what do we do? And I think about the only answer for that is we save as many of the options as possible. We've co-evolved with each other. We both depend on each other and we both reflect each other. Our agricultural system goes back hundreds of human generations. So all of our ancestors have had a role in conserving this diversity and handing it forward to us. We just have to hand it off to the next generation. <laughs> That's doable. And we know how to do it. It just takes being a little bit smart about it and making it a priority. Putting money into that is not on the agenda and it's not in the budget of a single government on earth. So there needs to be a little bit of an upswell of public opinion to say, hey, wait a minute. You're funding this, that, and the other. You're, you're probably building funding for the next war. You're building funding for this and that. You're building money to build a new football stadium and hold the next Olympics. Um, you know, one, two percent of which could fund the conservation of crop diversity forever. So how about let's get our priorities straight and just allocate enough funding once and for all to, in our lifetime, solve a world problem. Just one. This is really the central challenge that humanity faces. It's not going to get better by ignoring it. All the countries in the world doing something cooperative and for the long term is something that gives hope. We don't have too many examples of that in this world of ours. My big dream would be to, would be to get a few more collections into the seed vault and secure the financing with the proper endowment. And what's impossible about that? I, I don't think there's, I think it's, it's quite doable. Behind these doors, we have the foundation of life. It's our life on Earth. 
and it's the future of our food supply. Without that, we don't go very far.